Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined again today by Mr. Larry Vickers. And we're looking at some sort of foul, I guess. Yeah, buddy. What is You like fouls. What is this thing? This is an H&R T-48. American-made foul, huh? And yes, and That's it is cool. incredibly rare. <laughs> yes, yes it is. I'm an FAL guy, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, big fan of the platform for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of history with it and whatnot. And the Cold War. Absolutely. Mystique. This is one of the premier battle rifles of 20th century history. Absolutely. And in my opinion, the holy grail of collector-grade FALs is the T-48. I mean, that to me is the absolute pinnacle. Certainly here in the U.S., yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't even realize that the Americans built a foul. Mm -hmm. So of course, sure did. this this took place during the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, there was there were trials going on. NATO wanted to adopt a standard cartridge and a standard rifle, and the original idea was all of NATO, U.S. and Europe, would have the same infantry rifle. Yes, same rifle, same cartridge. You got it right. And so this was the foul was what Belgium actually put forth as a. a one of the rifles, the British put forth the EM-2, and the U.S. put forth the T-44, which is the rifle that would become the M-14. M14. Uh, and then there were a bunch of, they were trying to figure out a cartridge at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so the, basically there was sort of a, a non-verbal compromise made. The U.S. insisted on a cartridge with the same ballistics as 30-06, which was the T-65 cartridge, a.k.a. 7.62 NATO. Yeah. And kind of the implied deal was that as long as the, the Europeans adopted our cartridge, we would accept their rifle. Exactly. And, you know, interestingly enough, as you know, the early that early bullpup, early FALs were really built to be true assault rifles. They yeah. were built for intermediate cartridges to begin with. Yeah. And then they were beefed up for yeah. 762 NATO. Yeah, the 280-30 and... Um there, there were a variety of experimental cartridges, but yeah, they're they're definitely a little step below 7.62 NATO. Yes, absolutely. And then what you saw is the guns had to get bigger, the FALs had to get bigger, they had to get bulkier, you know, you had to get heavier. They had to be essentially beefed up to handle the the 30 caliber cartridge. Right. I've actually shot um, EM twos in both 280 and 7.62, and it's really much nicer in oh, 280. There's no doubt. Yeah. So at any rate, in uh, I believe it was 1955, the U.S. government issued a contract to Harrington Richardson to make 500 fowls, uh, both to investigate the possibility of setting up manufacture, like what's gonna, what kind of problems are we going to run into making these things, and to do more extended trials between this and the, so this was the T-48, and the T-44, which would become the M-14. You know, prior to this, you know, of course, Belgium had a number of T-48 rifles that they made in, in, in Belgium. Right. Uh, a number of those. And it's a little bit different configuration. Handguard was different looking. Okay. What you saw is that handguard configuration kind of morphed in later to what the Israelis used. Oh, interesting. So it's a little bit different ammo. Still a T-48, but it was essentially the FN made T-48. And then when H&R picked up the ball, they kind of added their own little twist to it. The handguards changed a bit. There's variety of features, which we're going to highlight here shortly, that are a little bit different than other FALs that you see out there. Right. And I think primarily they worked with the Canadians to mm -hmm. build these. So sure. Canada was the first major co country to adopt the FAL. That's right. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, let's take a closer look at uh, the things that make this different from all the other fouls. Excellent. So we'll start with the markings here. Uh, rifle caliber 30 T48 and uh, serial number on there. 4506. This weapon, as far as I know it, I got it. I did some horse trading for it a while back with a collector. It came out of the H and R Museum when that collection was uh, dissolved. This rifle came out of there. Nice. I think most people think of H and R for uh, crappy old little revolvers, yeah. not uh, not battle rifles. Exactly. Or you know, M1 Garands or M14s and whatnot. They don't think of them in that capacity. Now we also have this stock cartouche in there. And uh, I'll be honest, when I saw this in your collection, that was the thing that really jumped out at me. That's, it's a little hard to see uh, because it's a stamp in wood, but that's uh, an eagle with spread wings. Yeah. With a couple of stars. And that's what, a U.S. property mark? Yeah, U.S. property mark, U.S. acceptance mark. You know, you've seen this also on M16s. Uh, I have a matter of fact, I have an H&R M16A1 downstairs that has this in a white a paint stamp on okay. the front of the magazine well. 
So you'll see this acceptance stamp, you know, in, in different areas, U.S. government property, U.S. approved, whatever however you want to look at it. So the selector on this is full auto, but it looks like it's limited there. There's that extra pin in it. Yeah, you have the pin here, and then you've got this little beak. And what ends up happening is it allows you to only go to full auto. And you can't go, or excuse me, only go to semi-automatic repetition. You cannot go to full auto with this selector. You have to put a full automatic selector in it. Now, I'm sure this gun is set up to go fully automatic. It's just with this selector in it, it's limited only to semi-auto. Interestingly enough, Rhodesian FALs, which you and I have had a great, we got a great video on one of those. Uh -huh. You'll often see where they take this selector, which the metric one has an R right here to okay. go along with repetition. They'll grind off that beak and they'll okay. modify it in such a way it can go all the way over here. So it now acts as a, a selector to go to fully automatic. That's kind of like what the U.S. did disabling the full auto capability of a lot of M14s. Yes. They didn't actually take it out of the guns. They just made it impossible to easily switch yep. to. Because, I mean, the reality is for a shoulder-fired weapon in 7.62 NATO, they're just a, they're a limited to very, no value. I mean, it's just the, the cart. That's what an assault rifle is for. You know, right. The cartridge is just too powerful for fully automatic fire. All right. Now, if we look at some of the features that make this different from the other fouls out there, one of the ones that jumps out is that kind of squarish trigger guard. Yes. And a big open slot in the pistol grip. You got it. It's a folding winter trigger guard, which is probably the single most unique feature on the T48 series, specifically of the FN guns and the H&R. From what I understand now, from what I have seen, the limited guns that High Standard built do not have the folding winter trigger guard. Right. And that so, slot is to allow you to fold it, and it goes down into the slot. Oh, nice. We should mention, uh, this one is made by H&R. High Standard also got a contract, but they only made like 12 guns. Yeah, and it, it's interesting. You'll see pictures on the internet of, of various High Standard guns. I know, I personally don't know of any in private hands. There may be some. As far as I know, there's only seven of these in private hands. There may be a few High Standards in private hands, but by and large, they're virtually unknown. Okay. And this pops back up, and you just pop it back in the receiver. Like that. Nice. Now, it, like we were talking about before, Ian, as far as I know, the only country that actually adopted and fielded the folding winter trigger guard for the FAL is Luxembourg. Okay. They're the only ones. This was a very unique feature. And most people, when they see this, they consider it a T-48 style folding trigger guard. Luxembourg is the only one that, that brought it to the market or, or actually fielded it. And it must be said, not a super comfortable gun to hold because of the slot right here. Yeah, I noticed that. It feels yeah. fragile. It feels like if you grip it too hard, you're going to crack yeah, it. It's, it. Yeah. So you kind of see why it never really went anywhere. Uh, let's see. Next up, let's take a look at the charging handle. Oh, yeah. I'm going to stand that up so we can see it a little better. Uh, it works the same as all the others, but the shape's a little bit different. There. Yeah, totally unique design. Very much like a BAR oh, charging handle yeah, in that respect. That. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. They have a build-up portion here on the receiver itself, and then there's this spring-loaded plunger pin right here mm -hmm. that interfaces with... The little build-up portion to lock the charging handle forward. No. Very unique, very distinct. I, I don't know of any other FAL that has anything even close to this. And then the other thing right up there that's kind of unusual is the, the charger. Top, yeah. The top cover doesn't cover the whole thing. Exactly. Early on, this was not uncommon with FALs. You saw the Canadian guns with it, the Belgian T-48s and whatnot, is to be able to reload the magazine with stripper clips. And a and, few of them actually use this kind of horseshoe 10-round clip. Yes, exactly. And then you have this these two little nubs right up here that essentially act as guides for the bullets to feed down in. The big downside to this, of course, which is something that's haunted the FAL, really from its earliest days, is it allows debris and sand and whatnot into the action. It's not as sealed as it should be. For sure. And this is a gun that's known to be, I mean, you got to maintain it. You cannot treat this thing like a, an AK or you're going to have issues. Go ahead and lock that open. Let's show people just how much, yeah, the whole, it's almost like a CZ-52 in there when you, uh, Absolutely. When you don't have a dust cover. To yeah, I mean, that's on every shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? And just imagine now the standard FAL, like the Rhodesian one we did, this is all closed off. So this entire side is shielded from debris. Right. That change in and of itself would make a huge difference. And it's not just 
shot to shot, when you run empty, the gun's going to lock open like that. Exactly. So that, that's definitely a factor that has to be taken into consideration. All right, you see the wood handguard up here, kind of the classic distinctive, the classic distinctive triangular shape of an FAL. You saw the early Brit L1A1. The Canadians, of course, fielded their guns with this configuration, H&R T48 with this configuration. You saw this go away and to be replaced with plastic and whatnot because of the durability and the cracking issues with the wood. But this is kind of the distinctive classic shape of an FAL handguard. Two pieces that clamshell from the rear to the front, and there's a screw that goes across that okay. bolts it in through the gas block. Now up here, classic once again, very much like the Canadian C1. When you look at the gas block, gas plug, and the gas regulator, it's truly a mix of inch and metric FALs. Well, it makes sense, given that H&R did this with a lot of technical aid from the Canadians. From the Canadians, exactly. So when you see that, the guys who are savvy on FALs will spot this is essentially a metric a metric uh, gas regulator, and then the gas plug up here in the front side assembly is very much just like a, let me see if I can pull that out. It's in, here we go. Oh, nice. Yeah, this is very much like a what you'd see on an inch L1A1. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, and the gas piston, let's see here. Oh, I haven't shot this, and it doesn't even hardly appear it's been shot since leaving the factory. Nice. And then the wheel behind the front sight there is your gas regulator. That's your gas regulator, exactly. All right. Now, one thing to note, kind of interesting, the front sling swivel, and this is the only FAL I know of like this, is just nothing more than a stamping. Huh. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, most of the rest of them are certainly more substantial than that, but it's just a simple stamping for a front sling loop. And we got just what, a round post in there. Screws up and down. for. Yeah, and it's it's tapered. It's a little bit of a, you know inverse cone shape. Oh. So it is a tapered tapered cone. What's the rear sight on these guys? Is it pretty much standard foul? It is, but what you see is it's the taller type. Now, you know, the L1A1, they fold. So what you see on the rear sight, standard FAL type, the L1A1 was tall also like this, but it folded. The G1 was the first gun that the Belgians made, FAL series, where they mandated that the sight line be lower. Prior to that, FALs had a higher sight line in terms of higher front sight and rear sight. Hmm. And you see guns like Argentine guns and whatnot, that Israeli, they're made with essentially a, a, a tech data package in many ways that predates the G1 or they chose to go with the higher sight line. So that's why you'll see some FALs with a higher sight line and then the majority of the metric ones were later made after the G1 series with a lower sight line. Okay, interesting. And then the one last thing I see on there is, and we talked about this with the Rhodesian fell, it's got the locking, the, the break open lever that's vertical instead of horizontal. Absolutely. And then, like we talked about on the Rhodesian FAL, you're talking two issues here. With where, you know, one of the, you have a, a dovetail fit essentially down here, or an angled fit upper and lower, and what you'll see is with where this will go forward, and it can actually bottom out on the recoil shield here. Okay. And with any rifle grenade, you know, you launching rifle grenades off the muzzle, you have the tendency for the lever to come back and unhinge the upper and lower. And that's why you see them, you go down here with a horizontal lever. You have much more room for it to go down to adjust for upper and lower fit and much less likely to come open for rifle grenade use. Now, the U.S. didn't use, didn't anticipate using rifle grenades at all. No. Um, and the muzzle device is just a plain old flash hider here. Correct, yeah. So it prob that probably wouldn't have been as much much of an issue. Yes, but, but you go to countries like, you know, the South the South Africans, the Rhodesians, of course, used a lot of rifle grenades. So that yeah. all comes into play. So ultimately, these things went through testing and they did Arctic testing. They did dust testing. They did the whole suite uh, side by side with the M14. And I guess they came to the conclusion that they were both equally suitable. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, politics was the big black cloud over all this. Yeah. And I kind of get it. You know, we went over to Europe, we helped liberate Europe, we helped liberate Belgium, and I kind of get all that. Um, the theory was, you know, it was a real hard pill to swallow in the 1950s for America to adopt a foreign rifle. And, yeah. and I, I kind of understand where that's coming from. I think 
experience has kind of taught us for a battle rifle, the FAL is is a better gun than the M14. It they, certainly it, lasted a lot longer. It lasted a lot longer. There's various features on the M14 that kind of paint you into a corner. Not a real easy gun to mount an optic on. There's just a variety of things about that gun. Certainly a reliable gun and robust, but it, you're it's it's somewhat limiting in what you can do with it. Now it's you know it's lived on, of course, up until this day in, in a DMR sniper role. I mean, we still right. see it in that, but that's kind of almost ad hoc. And it's kind of because we had nothing else. Exactly. To do the job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the FAL really has kind of proven itself to be for a service rifle and 7.62 NATO certainly one. It's kind of the gold standard, and then you would you would throw the G3 in there, and you could argue yep. either way. They're both excellent rifles for what they did. But really, the M14 has proven itself, in my opinion, I'm sure you'd agree, to be an inferior battle rifle to the FAL. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so in the testing, the, basically no one was willing to come out and say which one might be better because no one really wanted to risk their career on it. So they approved both rifles in testing, and it went all the way up, I believe, to the chief of staff of the Army to make the decision. And uh, to, in order to kind of obfuscate the politics, they had two reasons that they actually officially chose the M14, those being it was slightly lighter, mm -hmm. and they thought at the time that they could manufacture it on M1 Garand tooling, where this was going to require completely new Two. tooling, and it would all be a mystery and a you know, whole new learning curve to figure out. Well, as it turned out, they couldn't make it make yeah. the M14 on M1 tools. They had to basically build all new tooling and all new learning curve. Well, you know, what's interesting too, a lot of people don't know this, Belgium offered their FAL to Great Britain and the United States royalty free. They could they did make, not yes, they that. did absolutely. Wow. So but they were, none of the L1A1s they ever paid a royalty essentially as a thank you for helping liberate <laughs> Belgium in World War II. The United States could build the gun I mean, they were they were no dummies. They realized if Britain and the United States were using their rifle, they would have people lined up to buy it. So yeah, for sure, it was it was completely understandable. But yeah, they had no licensing fee at all to build the gun. I did not realize that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that that's something you got to take you know in, in consideration. You know, it's kind of a sad chapter in American history. It, here's one thing I want you to think about: mm -hmm. if we would have adopted this, would we have ever went with the M16 because, you know, the M14 played in and the problems with the M14 in terms of building the gun, fielding it, you know what I mean? Teething issues and whatnot. And you could argue, well, we'd have had the same with this. I, you know, I don't know Not about so that. much. No, and, we probably wouldn't have. You know, I mean, Aussies in, in Vietnam, they largely used L1A1s. Now, I'm not saying they never used M16s because of the jungle environment per se. But it's really a big what if. What if we would have adopted the FAL? Would we have ever seen the M16? Yeah. Where would the United States be now? That's a really good question. Yeah, there's yeah. a big what if. All right. Well, you guys think about that. Tell us what you think down in the comments. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Tune in again tomorrow for more cool Forgotten Weapons. Have a good one.